at Cincy last month. Um, again, we want to thank our sponsors, uh, UCSD Moore's Cancer Center, AstraZeneca, and Charisma Therapeutics for their generous support. And um, their support is helping us develop a new website, which we hope will roll out sometime early next year. Um, uh, we're grateful to have our speaker today who's standing, uh, stepped in uh, because Carolina Paluga was unable to make it due to illness. And um, I'll just say one final thing that we hope you have a wonderful end of the year and, um, and we're looking forward to a great talk. So Jennifer. Great. Thanks, Judy. Yes. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today. Um, Tyler Miller is a research fellow in the Department of Pathology at the Mass General Hospital and the Department of Cancer Biology at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, where he's in the laboratory of Dr. Bradley Bernstein. Tyler received his MD and PhD from Case Western before joining the Mass General Hospital for his clinical pathology residency, uh, in which he served as chief resident in 2020. Tyler is incredibly accomplished, um, as demonstrated both, both by his publication record, as well as his funding record, which includes prior support from the American Brain Tumor Association, and uh, some really phenomenal current um, funding, which includes a K08 from the NCI, the prestigious Futures Leaders Fellowship from the UK Brain Tumor Charity, and the SITSI Bristol Myers Squibb Postdoctoral Cancer Immunotherapy Translational Fellowship, which I should mention is only awarded to one scientist each year. Tyler's already made quite a name for himself related to myeloid biology and glioblastoma. He's currently interviewing and will be transitioning to an independent faculty position to start his own lab um, in the summer of um, 2024, where we expect big things. And so I'm delighted to hand this over to Tyler. Tyler, thanks so much again. Great, thanks, Jen. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for the organizers for the opportunity to to present today. I'm I'm really excited to talk to you um, and and really honored to be part of this this seminar series. It's um it's been a great series so far and and lots of really fantastic speakers. So hopefully I'll uh, keep the standards up. Um, so today I really I want to talk about this this new story that we have um, just published on BioArchive and is under review currently. Really looking at glioma myeloid cells, but but larger than that, thinking about how do we understand and think about myeloid cells and tumors. Um, and, and so hopefully today I'll talk about, you know, give you some some how we're thinking about that and maybe some ways to think about how you're thinking about it in your own system. So first I'll just start out with an overview of the project and what I'm going to talk about today to give you some heads up of what's coming. So Really, we, we use a new analysis framework to reveal the consensus myeloid programs in glioma. And, and I say programs here really explicitly rather than states or cell types. We also really create a, a sort of large data resource for the field here. Um, and, and we hope together that we can use these um, to work together as a field, to, to work together as myeloid problem. So we think the framework will be useful for also non-responsive solid tumors outside of glioma, uh, the key to this framework was using consensus non-negative matrix factorization, which is CNMF, in place of the standard Louvain clustering, which is typically projected on a UMAP and use differential gene expression um, to, to look at the states there. Using this framework, we've discovered four main immunomodulatory programs that dominate glioma-associated myeloid cells. And, and almost 90 plus percent of myeloid cells in gliomas express one of these four immunomodulatory programs. This is independent of cell type. So, so there are also other programs that define cell type. This is independent of that. We think these four programs specifically dictate the overall immune state of the tumor in response to immunotherapy. I'll show you a little bit of data on that. Each of these programs have distinct tumor niches and, and we think are driven by unique factors. These are the, the four programs. There's two immunosuppressive, two inflammatory. The, the one C1Q immunosuppressive program has lots of complement factors um, and, and other immunosuppressive markers, while the scavenger immunosuppressive program is really um, dictated by these scavenger receptors that are upregulated on these cells. The two um, inflammatory programs are, are distinct from each other as well. Um, the CXCR4 inflammatory program has cytokines and other things that, that um, look to be like they're, they're sort of like anti-tumor. Um, and good for the tumor, where the IL-1 beta inflammatory program is likely a recruitment program, IL-1 beta, TNF-alpha, CCL2, OSM, and other cytokines. 
These are not driven by cell type or origin. In fact, using lineage tracing, all the myeloid programs are expressed in cells that can originate in the periphery. And the hypothesis at the end of this is that if we can modulate these immunomodulatory programs, we'll be able to enable current immunotherapies to be more effective. So the outline, I'll start with some background over sort of glioma and immunotherapy and, and in general myeloid cells in this space. Then I'll talk about the discovery platform um, and, and spend a lot of time here. This is, you know, the, the data that we've generated, the new sort of analysis framework we're using, and a little bit about the model systems we're using to test these. And then I'll finish up with clinical relevance and some future work. And so gliomas um, really are terrible malignancies. They're incurable. They have, we have no good therapies. Um, you know, the patients and, and families of these patients, you know, suffer tremendously from this disease. It's the most common primary malignant brain tumor. The prognosis is, is dictated by IDH mutation. So IDH wild type tumors tend to be older patients, overall survivors only 15 months. Um, IDH mutant tumors tend to be in younger patients. The overall survival is still not great, 3.5 years. Um, we don't really have any good therapies. The standard of care currently is surgery radiation and temozolomide. Um, we, this hasn't changed for many years. The last adjuvant therapeutic improvement came almost 20 years ago, and it really only added three months of survival with the addition of, of temozolomide. It's not for lack of trying, though. We've, we've tried in this field for years many molecularly driven targeted therapies, including a lot of the tyrosine kinases that you see on, on the screen. None of them have worked. There was there was a big light of hope for the field um, over the summer when this paper was published in the New England Journal that showed vorsidinib, this IDH inhibitor, uh, was quite effective for patients with low grade, so like grade two IDH mutant gliomas. This happens to be the small subset of patients for gliomas, um, but was great for them, you know, to be determined what this looks like for higher grade IDH mutant tumors. The reason for this um, sort of resistance is really the heterogeneity that is the hallmark of this disease. And so glioblastoma multiforme, as it's called, um, has been known for a long time to be heterogeneous. You can see it here in the MRI where you have macroscopic heterogeneity that's in the tumor. You can see this under a scope with the microscopic heterogeneity that you see in this H&E. And then, you know, recently, sort of comprehensive single cell RNA sequencing studies to really advance our understanding of the malignant cells in glioma. And it, and it showed us that there are these heterogeneous, interchangeable four states. Um, if you hit one of them, the others just sort of grow up and, and create the tumor around it. Uh, all these states exist in most tumors and they're hard to target all of them. Um, something that was happening when I was going through my PhD work and we were working on this and had all these failures was that immunotherapy was revolutionizing cancer care and other diseases. This is when CAR T cells were really, you know, hitting the mainstream with, with these, you know, sort of dramatic um, survivals from, from refractory ALL. Um, checkpoint blockade was becoming something that was extending the lifespan of melanoma patients for years um, and now has, has, you know, completely changed the, the disease course um, for these patients. I wanted to, you know, I, I personally think that immunotherapy is the best shot at cure for glioma, a way to get at that heterogeneity um, that we see in this tumor where you have your immune system fighting sort of one-on-one -on -one against, against these cancer cells. Um, but unfortunately, immunotherapy trials have not been successful thus far. It's, again, not for lack of trying. There's been a number of trials, including some here in Boston, um, that just didn't show any survival benefit by adding uh, checkpoint therapy for these patients. Um, there's lots of reasons why this might be the case. Uh, the biggest hurdle, um, I think, is probably the immunosuppressive environment that's imposed by myeloid cells. And I love showing this picture at the bottom where you have on the left, this normal cortex where you have normal microglia stained in brown here. And then you can see these microglia get really activated. You get additional uh, macrophages coming into the tumor in astrocytomas, which is sort of a grade three tumor here. And then in grade four glioblastoma, you know, these tumors just chock full of immunosuppressive macrophages. And they can make up to like 50% of the cells in these tumors. And, and so how do we harness that potential? Because in theory, these cells should be able to attack the tumor, recruit other cells into attack the tumor. 
um, to fight back against uh, these glioblastoma cells. This high macrophage density in cancer has been associated with poor outcomes, not just in, in brain tumors, but in many different tumors. Um, and, and this is a nice review um, from a few years ago that showed, you know, basically in all these tumors here in red, high macrophage density, poor prognosis. Um, and this has been shown in a couple different studies in glioma where you have, um, if you have specific markers of immunosuppression in the myeloid cell population, high levels of those tend to be um, associated with worse overall survival. So what do we know about myeloid cells in brain tumors? We know that they tend to be um, derived from two distinct cellular origins. One on the right here is, is the fetal yolk sac. Uh, and so you get um, progenitors uh, sort of migrating up into the brain. They populate the brain, at least in mice, in homeostatic conditions. They don't get replenished by the peripheral monocytes coming in. Um, but in tumors, we know that there are cells that come in from the periphery. And so you have these hematopoietic stem cells that give rise to monocytes. Those travel through the, through the bloodstream, extravagate out of, um, of blood vessels and into the tumor. And so a adult glioma has um, many different types of myeloid cells, microglia, macrophage, monocytes, dendritic cells, and neutrophils um, that, that exist within the tumor, some coming from you know, the original microglia, some coming from peripheral monocytes. And the framework in which most people in the field have thought about um, and, and how we went into this thinking about it was that myeloid cells in glioma are studied with respect to cell type and or cell origin. So what is the cell type first and then and then maybe what it's doing? And or where did it come from? And maybe that's dictating its activity. Um, and so there's a number of studies that have been published. This is one of the you know, so early single cell studies that really looked at markers on, on the surface of these cells and said, were these microglia derived tumor associated macrophages or, or blood derived? Um, there's this paper from Joanna Joyce's group uh, a, a couple of years back now, um, where they had looked at using facts and, and marker analysis, were these cells coming from microglia or were they um, sort of monocyte derived macrophages coming in? And so it had sort of both cell type and cell origin mixed in here. And then here's a review from a couple of years back where really, you know, people are classifying these as the different cell types and, and generalizing that cell type as a microglia that doesn't have suppressive function, for example. Other single cell studies, um, again, have studied this with respect to cell type and cell origin. And, and so, you know, microglia versus macrophage here, um, this study in, in Nature Neuroscience from 2021, you know, looked at microglia derived um, tumor associated macrophages versus monocyte derived, and then tried to associate um, activities on top of that. And, and this one that was in Nature Communications last year came out and, and first goes my, microglia and then activity um, after that and tries to separate these in, in single cell data clusters. Certainly there's other myeloid cell um, papers that have been out there. There's lots of really good studies that have shown these cells do have an impact on the, on the cancer cells and on the T cells and that that's a two-way street. And so what we really need in the field and, and what we sort of set out to do was to say, what is the consensus programs? What are the consensus myeloid cell programs that exist within these gliomas? Every one of those studies that I showed you sort of had their own way of classifying um, these cells. And it's hard then to compare across different studies and, and really sort of know what that cell type is um, in, in that other study. And so we set out to create comprehensive data on, on human myeloid cells in glioma and, and to create this sort of consensus, um, this consensus data set, and then use some functional models uh, to be able to, to do functional perturbations and, and, and validate some of the discoveries we made with the data. And so when I, I started my postdoc um, five years ago or so, uh, the, the the idea was how do we overcome myeloid suppression and really create effective immunotherapies for glioma patients? And what do we need to do that? And and we sort of took the long view approach here and wanted to create a platform both for discovery and then translation. And so the two pillars of that platform really are we need to first understand the problem better. And so if we define the immunomodulatory 
myeloid programs in glioma, identify the potential drivers of those programs, and then reveal potential targeting strategies with sort of this, this large data approach. And then we need a functional model. And so we needed and, and really wanted to develop, because it didn't exist at the time when I was starting, a scalable functional human model system where we could model the immunomodulatory myeloid programs that we're seeing in, in, in human gliomas, modulate those programs and study mechanisms, and then test perturbations that potentially reduce the suppression. So this is a very busy slide, um, and, but I'm going to go through it one at a time as I, I go through here. Um, but this is this is sort of what we've come up with um, for this platform. So on the data side, we have single cell RNA sequencing data. We've used mitochondrial lineage tracing data in human single cells to sort of understand where the origin of these of these cells coming from. We've used spatial transcriptomics to understand what the niches are um, where these myeloid cells exist within the tumor. And then we have sort of clinical data and these large consortium data sets with bulk RNA seq, where we can then test, you know, what how these impact, you know, overall survival and things where we have that data. The other piece of this is the model system. And so we were very lucky that a group at Penn um, with Hong Jong Song had created this model system and published it in cell in 2020. In January of 2020, right before the pandemic, I tried it out in February of 2020 on the first tumor sample we got into the lab um, after that paper, and it just worked. And it worked beautifully. And, and I worked with the first author there to sort of, you know, modify it a little bit. Um, but but it's been a really great model for us. And so the model is you basically take a primary tumor, you chop it up into small pieces, one to two millimeter pieces. You put it in an orbital shaker um, and just culture it in permissive media. And that enables the entire tumor microenvironment of that tumor. It's sort of like an explant of the tumor to survive in that context for two weeks to, to two months, basically, um, depending on the, how fast the tumor is growing and things. And so you have a window here then to perturb um, different myeloid cell programs during that time when they exist within the tumor context. We then optimize this, uh, this model to try to make it more sustainable. So you, these cells that, that are in this um, organoid system, the malignant cells will grow for years. Um, and so you can have these organoids, and I've had some in culture that have been in culture for two years now, um, that you can then add back in donor monocytes or patient monocytes. So you, all you're left with at that time is just the malignant cells because all of the other sort of tumor microenvironmental cells have been outcompeted. And so if you have basically a big ball of cancer cells with their own extracellular matrix and signaling that's happening, and you can put these back in, they infiltrate in to that uh, human organoid and they differentiate into the, the programs that we see in the tumor. And this is what this model looks like. So this is like a resection from, from a human glioma. We chop up into small pieces. After a couple of weeks, they, these like small pieces form these mature organoids that you can then put into 96 well plates and do these co-culturing experiments or do perturbation experiments on them. And you read them out with either single cell sequencing or um, histology or flow cytometry. And this is an example, and it's a, it's a really nice example because it's a really complex tumor of a patient. So this was a, about a 40 year old male. Um, he had not been treated with dexamethasone, which you'll find out is an important thing. Um, and he uh, had an IDH mutant high grade glioma. And so this was two weeks after the surgery, we had sequenced his primary tumor and then we sequenced the organoids derived from that tumor. And on the, on the left here, you can see all the different cell types that were present. And, and this was a very, again, complex tumor with plasma cells and, and neutrophils and um, different myeloid cells, endothelial cells, mast cells. And then you had the stromal cells like oligodendrocytes and pericytes, um, along with the tumor cells and, and the other myeloid cells and T cells. And after um, two weeks, the organoid, which here is in uh, red, the cells derived from the organoid, basically have the same profiles as they had when we took it out of the, the patient two weeks earlier. 
Um, the T cells tend to be the first thing to go, not surprisingly. The myeloid cells stick around um, pretty well, actually. Um, the tumor cells maintain their states, and these tumor cells actually maintain their states um, for, for years. Uh, we've done this now um, for, for tumors that have been a year old, and, and you still get the good uh, malignant cell states. All right, so that so that's the the model, and I'll go back to the data now. So, the first thing we wanted to do was create this comprehensive data set to really understand the myeloid cells better, and so um, we went and wanted to basically take all cells in the tumor. So we had what are the other cell types and other cell programs that are expressed in the tumors with these myeloid cells, and so um, Josh Antonio and Julia Virgo, two uh, technicians that worked with me and did a lot of a lot of this. Um, this work to, to do the actual single cell sequencing. And then Shadi Alferan is a uh, postdoc in the lab um, with Brad is a really good computational biologist in single cell biology um, and has led most of this analysis. Um, so we took basically everything except for dead cells and we sequenced it. Um, we had 22 tumors we prospectively collected here. Given these were really heterogeneous tumors, we sort of took all comers. Uh, we felt like we needed more tumors to to enhance the the data set, and so we brought in two other data sets where um, the groups had basically done the same type of collection method, had used similar technology for single cell sequencing, which was sort of more advanced V three technology, um, and we were using a, a sequel here. Um, we also had a validation cohort that we then um, validated these in that had used ten x V two data um, on forty one tumors from McGill. Half of these weren't published. Um, at this time. And so the total data set that we have is 85 tumors. And, the, and again, these are diverse. So it's IDH wild type, IDH mutant, primary, recurrent, tumors treated with different types of therapies. The goal here was to understand what is the universe of, of programs in, in myeloid cells and gliomas. And so the first thing we did is what sort of everybody else typically does is to do Louvain clustering and put them on a UMAP um, and then try to make sense of the different clusters. Um, and I'll be honest, it was just really hard to make sense of the different clusters here. Uh, you could see the neutrophils come out really well. Cycling cells came out pretty well. Dendritic cells um, sort of popped off here. But the bulk of the myeloid cells in this tumor all sort of landed in what is a big ball of cells that were sort of artificially separated into clusters um, by some program. Uh, and so it was hard. There was a lot of mixing that was going. We didn't know what to do. And so we turned to... CNMF. So this is consensus non-negative matrix factorization. NMF has been around for a while. CNMF is sort of um, an optimization and elaboration on that. Um, was published by Party Sabetti and, and Doug Melton's group um, in 2019. And the whole goal here is to decompose single cell RNA-seq data into distinct gene expression programs. And so this basically says, what are the sets of genes that go up and down together across thousands of cells um, in single cell RNA sequencing data? And those sets of genes that are highly correlated with each other, those become gene programs. And you find identity programs. So these are programs that um, sort of identify cell type, microglia, macrophage, and then activity programs, what the cell is doing. And importantly, you can have more than one cell program per cell. And so this is sort of an example of what this might look like. You can have a cell program that says, hey, this cell is a microglia, and then another cell is a macrophage, and another cell is a monocyte. And then separately, you can have a program expressed in that cell that tells you what the cell is doing. And so you might have a pro-tumor program, an immunosuppressive program that's expressed in microglia. That same program can also be expressed in a macrophage. And so if, if this is what's happening in the myeloid cells, what you would see is that you would get this like sort of very sort of smear of cell types because you would have the same program be expressed in different cell types and you sort of get what you would you, you see in the UMAP. Oppose this to Levain clustering, which is what we had done originally, where this group's cells based on similarities in gene expression profiles. And each cell is treated as a singular unit and it's put in space closest to the cell that looks closest to it. Um, the gene expression programs here, or the states, are then derived from that cluster and all the cells in that cluster average gene expression compared to the other clusters. So we move forward with consensus non-negative matrix factorization as, as our, our method of choice. And I think it's, um, hopefully I'll show you, it's proved to be really beneficial. 
So what we did here is we used CNMF to identify gene expression programs separately, independently in these three different cohorts. So we had then had gene programs for each of these of these cohorts. We grouped the programs across the cohorts by similarity, and and I will say that they were very similar. This is the actual um, the actual data from this, and and you see very sort of distinct groups. Um, then we had these 14 consensus programs created by averaging the gene program scores for all the, the programs in each one of these groups. So, so we pulled out these 14 programs. Five of them are identity programs. And so this tells you if it's a microglia, macrophage, monocyte, dendritic cell, for example. And, and these have pretty distinct programs. These are just like the top 20 genes, the expression of top 20 genes in each of these programs. Um, and then we also had nine activity programs. Five of these, these ones at the bottom, were sort of stimulus response programs, hypoxia response, interferon response, cycling cells. These were very distinct um, and, and sort of spread across these different cell types. The ones that were most interesting to us were the ones that were here in the middle. So there were two inflammatory programs and two immunosuppressive programs. And they were interesting for two reasons. One, they tended to be expressed across many of the different cell types. So they were shared across the different cell types. And two, what was quite interesting is these programs were utilized by the myeloid cells most, more than even the cell identity programs in, in, in many, um, many ways. And so these became super interesting. We, we wanted to study these four programs further. And so this is simply a, a graph of what percent of microglia expressed each of these programs, each of these activity programs. And so what you can see is a, a microglia identified by the program for the microglia program. These microglia could express any number of given programs. So 50% maybe express this one, but 20% express this one. What's interesting about this is that each activity program can also be expressed by more than one cell type. And so what this shows us is this IL-1 beta inflammatory program, for example, is being utilized, that same program is utilized by microglia, macrophage, monocytes, and dendritic cells. And if you take those activity programs and you put them back on top of the UMAP to look at where they exist, and, and so these are the four here in the middle of the immunomodulatory programs, what you can see is that those immunomodulatory programs exist are expressed in cells that exist in many of the different clusters, four or five of the different clusters, which is why it's really hard to sort of pull these specific programs out just by using um, sort of Louvain clustering. And so this sort of made us change the way we wanted to classify and think about the myeloid cells. Rather than thinking about them as cell type first, for example, should we think about them about what they're actually doing? What is what is the activity program that they express? And so this graph ends up being something that we use quite a bit, um, and and you'll see throughout the the presentation, um, where we basically plot every single one of these myeloid cells in space by their expression of these four programs. Um, so you know myeloid cells that basically are completely expressing this program are up here, but ones that sort of share the two are expressing sort of the two inflammatory programs can be in the middle here. You can use this and layer over additional information. So here we layer over if this is a microglia versus monocyte versus macrophage, you can see sort of enrichments of microglia in the inflammatory programs, but also in this immunosuppressive program down here, whereas monocytes tend to only express the IL-1 beta program and the scavenger immunosuppressive program, for example. Okay. So if we now think about myeloid cells in this context, we're thinking about their activity as being the thing that we really want to classify them by, what's the driver of that activity? And, and you know, it could be a number of different things. We don't think it's cell type based on the fact that more than one cell type is expressing each of those programs. Um, is it the origin? Is it possible that the origin is dictating where these, um, what programs are being expressed um, in the cells? And so we turned to this um, technology that we had developed um, and published last year called MASTER, which utilizes mitochondrial DNA mutations in single cell data to infer the lineage of those cells. And so if a uh, the profile of the mitochondrial mutations more closely matches, for example, blood marrow derived 
uh, macrophages, bone marrow derived macrophages, versus microglia derived macrophages, or or sort of microglia that are that are in the tumor. We can sort of separate out where they're coming from, and I'm not going to go through all the data because I don't have time. But the I'll summarize it here. So most of the cells, um, but not all of them, interestingly, expressing a microglia program came from resident myeloid cells. So the resident microglia. Cells expressing all other cell identity programs come from the blood, not surprisingly. What was interesting is this microglia-like population. So these were uh, cells, myeloid cells that express both a microglia program and a macrophage program. So they were these little, these were these intermediate cells. They could have come from either direction in theory, right? They could have either come from macrophages that then were sort of taking on a more microglia program, or they could have come from microglia that were taking on a more macrophage program. It turns out that nearly all of those cells come from the blood, um, which was just quite interesting that they were all sort of this unidirectional way. The activity programs, interestingly, are expressed equally across cell types and didn't have any consistent origin. So the, the immunomodulatory programs we're talking about, they, they come from wherever. And the peripheral cells um, turn on a microlead program ex vivo. And so here we had used our, um, our organoid system where we had an organoid that had no myeloid cells left in it. There's actually no other cells except for malignant cells left in it. We took the same patient's PBMCs that we had frozen down at the time of surgery, with all them out, and we co-cultured them um, with these organoids. And what we find is after seven days, these myeloid cells had infiltrated in, and they had started turning on microglia markers, TMM 119 P2RY12, markers that for most people in this field, if you said this was Co um, these was double positive for this marker, you say that's a microglia. And so here saying, hey, there are actually monocytes from the periphery that come into this tumor in the right environment and turn on a microglia program. Cool. Okay, so not origin is the, is the answer of what's driving these programs. So the question was, is it something, is, is the clinical context that they're in, um, something about the tumor driving them? And so IDH mutation is such an important um, sort of aberration in these tumors that we first looked at that. And so we had our 85 tumors. We looked at, we had IDH mutant and wild type, and we looked at what was the average program expression per tumor for these different programs within the myeloid cells. And it turns out that this one CXCR4 inflammatory program was the program that was most enriched in IDH mutant cells. The two suppressive programs were depleted in the, in the IDH mutant cells. Um, and the monocytes were the of the of the sort of cell types. The monocytes were the only thing that had any difference between IDH wild type and mutant, and it was enriched in the wild types. Again, not super surprising. The thing that was interesting here and and was a little bit surprising to me was this could be um, the the differences that we see in IDH mutant tumors could be the um, consequence of the IDH mutation itself and the 2-HG oncometabolite that's produced and goes in the environment. I thought maybe that was the thing that was driving the differences in the myeloid cells. It could also just be the fact that IDH mutant tumors tend to be lower grade, or at least the lower grade tumors um, are enriched in IDH uh, mutant tumors. And so we used our, our um, sort of quadrant plot here and we plotted out IDH mutation status on top of it. And while it's enriched up here and depleted down here, um, what was a better predictor of the phenotype that we saw was a grade. And so grade explained what we were seeing much better than IDH mutation itself. So IDH um, mutant low-grade tumors were very much um, more likely to be expressing the CXCR4 program and not expressing the immunosuppressive programs, for example. And if you then go down and um, look at these by tumor and look at the average expression per tumor, what you tend to see is that the low grade tumors have much higher and the higher grade tumors, so grade four IDH mutant tumors, they basically have the same as IDH, um, as IDH wild type tumors. And if you extend this out to the CCGA data where we have histology for the IDH wild type tumors, um, you can see that IDH wild types also have the same pattern as the IDH mutants when it comes to grade um, and the lower grades being sort of enriched in this. So we think that this is actually a grade thing. And so the conclusion is the environment is significantly influencing the immunomodulatory programs because grade to a pathologist, if you look under a scope, um, the only difference there is what that environment looks like. And so it, we think that the environment here is the thing that's driving um, 
these uh, these programs. So we then turn to spatial transcriptomics. So okay, so what is, what is the niche that is driving this? And so um, Heinrich Heiland, uh, who is a neurosurgeon in Germany, had this nice data set of 23 10x visium sections from human gliomas. And uh, another neurosurgeon um, here, Charles Couturier, who's who's here in Boston and co-first author on this paper, um, pushed forward a lot of the analysis. There are two neurosurgeons that both take tumors out of people's heads and, and are really good computational biologists. Um, so it's so lucky to work with both of them. Um, so what we did is we basically used CNMF and we said, what are the niche programs that are expressed within these tumors. And really just like, if we take all of the, the data from each of these pixels, these 50 micron pixels, and say, what are the programs we see? What you end up getting out of these, these sort of anatomical programs where you have white matter, gray matter, and then you have the cancer, proliferative cancer area. You have inflammation, vasculature, and hypoxia. And in parallel, we basically laid over um, on those sections the cellular programs that we see from the single cell RNA sequencing data. And I love this particular section as an example, because you have hypoxia here in black, you have inflammation here in yellow that's surrounding it that then goes into the tumor core, and you have sort of vasculature here in red. And what you can see is the cancer cell programs have this beautiful layering around the, the hypoxic core here. And what was striking to us, if you go to the bottom here, and these are the four immunomodulatory programs, is that that also had sort of different places within the tumor where these myeloid programs existed. So the scavenger immunosuppressive program, for example, super associated with hypoxia, whereas the other immunosuppressive program is basically everywhere except hypoxic regions. And so you have these sort of spatially distinct immunosuppressive programs in this tumor. If you take all 23 sections um, and you look at um, utilizing that data and like, create this spatial map um, of those of both the, the niches and how they line up with each other, but then also how these programs line up within the niches, um, you get this map. And what you can see is for the myeloid programs, for example, each of them have sort of a distinct niche where they tend to reside. Um, and so then what are the things that are within that niche that are driving it? So we think there's something within the hypoxic niche that's driving the scavenger immunosuppressive program, for example. We weren't sure for example, what was driving the other immunosuppressive program, which tended to be everywhere else. And so I'm going to switch over to the clinical relevance of this um, and, and think about the impact of the therapies, because we were thinking about what could be the, um, the thing that was driving the other immunosuppressive program. And we looked at dexamethasone because it's a really potent glucocorticoid that's a common anti-inflammatory agent used in these patients to decrease vasogenic edema. And most patients for glioma receive dexamethasone if they present with neurological symptoms in the ED. And then most of them actually get it during surgery because it helps make the surgery easier for the surgeons. And so for many institutions, dexamethasone treatment is standard of care. And so we looked at, because we had all the clinical data for our, for our samples, we went in the EMR and we said, oh, let's look at the amount of dexamethasone these patients got and correlate that with myeloid program expression. And so it was very clear from this was that the C1Q program, the program that was everywhere else except hypoxia, was like very associated with the amount of dexamethasone these patients got. Dendritic cells were anti-correlated with the amount of dexamethasone patients got. And because we were in Boston and there were immunotherapy trials going on, the, the surgeons and, and the clinicians here are a little bit more cautious about their use of dexamethasone. And so we had a small cohort of patients who didn't receive it. And so we matched that up um, with, with the cohort that had received it here in Boston. And what you can see here, so these are patients that received um, dexamethasone. This is this, this C1Q immunosuppressive program expression and those that did not. So it was very clear, it seemed like from the clinical data, that dexamethasone might be important for this program. And then we went and we utilized our, um, our organoid model again and looked at, can we actually recapitulate what we see in the primary tumor with dexamethasone? So Zhe Yu Chen, who's a, who's a immunologist from, from John Wary's lab as a postdoc in, in Brad's lab has really, you know, really helped us create sort of a panel of, of markers that we can sort of 
classify each of these cell programs by flow cytometry and, and Josh and Antonio is one of the technicians helps with all the organoid culture. Um, so here we basically took this organoid, we put donor monocytes onto the organoid. We put dexamethasone or DMSO and let them go for two weeks. And you see this dramatic upregulation of, of CD163, which is one of the markers of the immunosuppressive programs. We tried a, an experiment where, hey, let's wash this out. So there's many patients in the clinic that get dexamethasone for two days during surgery. So they, they sort of get it right before surgery, during surgery, and then they're taken off of it. And then for immunotherapy trials, at the end of that time, they tend to get started on checkpoint or, or, or if it's CAR-T, um, something with that. So we want to say, if we wash it out, we just let it go, will this phenotype reverse? And it turns out it's no, it, it was basically irreversible. We actually took this out to 28 days and nothing changed. They were all still sort of immunosuppressive. We tried even then to do high dose interferon gamma to reverse this. Um, so we did this two days and then we did a washout and then we did interferon gamma to see if we could reverse it down and we only still only got partial rescue. So here this like this phenotype is this irreversible um, immunosuppressive program that's been posed on myeloid cells using dexamethasone. So the conclusion is that something in the hypoxic niche is likely driving the scavenger immunosuppressive program. Why is dexamethasone is likely driven by the C1Q? The, the next question for us was, does this have any impact on immunotherapy response or overall survival? And so we were lucky over the summer that there was this paper published in Nature Cancer that identified cyclic 9 as an immune checkpoint molecule on macrophages in glioblastoma. Um, and the thing that was really lucky for us is we had this data set that was single cell RNA sequencing data set for patients treated with neoadjuvant um, checkpoint therapy. So they had gotten um, Nevo for two weeks and then they ended up having surgery and then they were kept on checkpoint therapy until they sort of progressed. And they classified these patients as responding and non-responding. So they had five non-responders and seven responders. And so what we did is we took all their single cell data and we plotted it on our quadrant plot to look at how our immunomodulatory programs were expressed within their data. And we looked at SIGLIC9 expression, for example, to see was that enriched in for one of our programs in cells expressing one of our programs. And it turned out not really. It was sort of all over the place. Um, but then we did another analysis, which is we took all their, all their cells that were plotted on here and we just labeled what cells were in responding tumors versus what cells were in non-responding tumors. And now all of a sudden, these programs made a lot of sense um, uh, of that data. And so here, the patients with the responding tumors had a much higher level of the CXCR4 inflammatory program and, and the IL-1 beta inflammatory program, whereas those in non-responding tumors were really enriched in the scavenger immunosuppressive program. And we can then look at this by sort of by tumor here and say, what is the average expression in myeloid cells of cyclic like nine on a per tumor basis? Um, and, and this wasn't really significant between responder and non-responder, whereas scavenger immunosuppressive program was. And if you actually take just the cyclic like nine positive cells and you classify those cells by the program, the immunomodulatory program they are they're expressing, what you can tell here is that most of the um, impact that they saw with SIGLIC-9 was coming from SIGLIC-9 cells that were expressing the scavenger immunosuppressive program. And, and so you tease that out here. And so that looked really good for that small immunotherapy set. Can we expand that beyond that? I would love to have better and, and larger immunotherapy um, clinical trial data sets we could explore, but we just wanted to have another surrogate for immunotherapy response, which was Tregs. And so we looked at tumors that had high Tregs. Um, what were they enriched in any of our myeloid programs across the 85 tumors that we had? And it turns out that um, tumors that had high Tregs also had high levels of the C1Q and scavenger immunosuppressive programs. And patients in a larger sort of consortium data set um, that had high levels of these two programs tended to have poor overall survival. And so in summary, I think we have this um, this idea where we have this proposed new framework for glioma associated myeloid cells um, that that you know I think is relevant just not only for glioma but for for other for other tumor types. And and this is how we're thinking about it. 
the myeloid states are composed of superimposable identity and activity programs, and we think they should be annotated as such. The myeloid cells themselves are incredibly plastic and likely driven mostly by the microenvironment. The, these immunomodulatory programs shape the overall immune state of gliomas and, and likely dictate immunotherapy response that these programs can be modulated by clinical and experimental interventions, and that our therapeutic interventions should target specific immunomodulatory programs rather than indiscriminate myeloid cell targeting. Um, to make this, and we're very much open science people, um, to make this um, possible for other people to utilize in your favorite system, um, we put everything, all of the, um, the code that we use, all different programs, the settings we use into a GitHub repository that that, that Shadi is, is overseeing to try to make it really easy uh, for people to do this. Um, and so so I think in summary, the whole project, we have this new uh, you know, analysis framework. We discover the consensus myeloid programs in glioma. And again, really hoping that we can work together in the field to work on this problem. You know, I talked about CNMF as being the important piece of of this um, of this new framework, and and finally, there's these four main immunomodulatory programs that are independent of cell type and cell origin, um, and these four programs are sort of on this schematic here. And so, the CXCO4 inflammatory program is really associated with low grade lesions, where we see more normal neuronal cell types that exist and that they're interacting with. We don't know exactly what is causing that program to be expressed, but we think it's actually good for the patient to have this in their tumor. Um, the IL-1 beta inflammatory program, we think is actually just the default um, program that, that myeloid cells um, express in any given sort of inflammatory condition. Because we see this in gliomas, we see this in other uh, cancer types, we see this actually in the blood of glioma patients. This is a program expressing CCL2 and TNF-alpha, IL-1-beta, OSM, other cytokines that are recruiting myeloid cells into this inflammatory lesion. The I don't know, and, and it may be bad for the tumor. Um, that is yet to be determined, but it, it, it doesn't. It's clearly doesn't seem to be very good for the tumor at this point. Um, the two immunosuppressive programs I talked a lot about, one driven by hypoxia and one driven by dexamethasone. And, and hopefully the, the goal is if we can modulate these immunomodulatory programs, enable current immunotherapies to be more effective. So this story was, was posted on in October in BioArchive um, with all this data and, and a lot more data, actually. Um, at the same time, there was another paper um, published from Dan Landau and Joanna Joyce um, led by near Ben Chitri on breast cancer. And they had many very similar themes. So tumor-associated myeloid cells, the tumor niche drive cell activity, um, cell activity is independent of cell type and origin, that myeloid cell activity is associated with patient outcomes, and that we both actually have human organoid models that can be used to study the human myeloid human tumor interactions. The last two things that I'll point out um, for people interested, and again, sort of the open science method, we created a Shiny app that allows people who, for our, our myeloid programs um, in glioma, if they want to um, calculate those program expression in their own cells, they can just upload their gene expression matrix um, to this website, um, and it will calculate all those programs and spit out a, um, a, a spreadsheet that basically has your cells and then the usage of each of these programs um, in, in glioma cells. And finally, we have all this data up on the single cell portal at the Broad. Um, it allows you, it's a really cool tool. It allows you to then, without any coding experience whatsoever, you just plug in your favorite gene, you see where it's expressed within the data set. There are like 600 some um, single cell RNA-seq data sets in this portal. It's open to the public. Um, this is sort of just a view of what this looks like. These are all the different cell types that are, are part of this data sets, over half a million cells. Um, these are the myeloid cells down here. We've also created it so that you can create, um, we sort of have this quadrant plot. And so you can take your favorite gene and look at where it's expressed um, within this quadrant plot. This is IL-1 beta program. And then this is the IL-1 beta gene itself and just where it's being expressed. And so I'll just finish up um, with the last minute or two. So where do we go from here? And so I think, you know, 
if we use this analysis method and the, this framework of thinking for myeloid cells, what do the myeloid cells look like in other cancers? What do myeloid cells look like in other pathologies and normal tissue? Uh, we're super excited to explore this area. I'm super happy to collaborate with other people, um, help them use this in their own system. Um, this is my email. I'm on Twitter as well. Um, there's a whole post about uh, this on Twitter when we publish that paper. Um, and then finally, I'll thank the team. And it's a really phenomenal team. So Shadi and, and Charles, um, both really great computational biologists. Um, Zayu and Josh and Julia have done a lot of work um, with the experimental organoid system. Um, and then and then the mentors, Brad um, has been a phenomenal mentor, Mar Mario as well, and um, Alex Shalik, um, a lot of people from his lab. And finally, the funding, as, um, as Jen mentioned when we started, I've been really fortunate to have uh, phenomenal funding over the years um, and uh, really appreciative to the Brain Tumor Charity, NIH, and, and SITSI and the American Brain Tumor Association for their support. So for there, I'll, I'll stop and, and be happy to take questions and, and chat about what your guys' thoughts are on this. Hmm. Well, um, thank you very much. That was impressive and uh, really thought provoking. Um, uh, let's take questions uh, from the audience um, first. So Abhi Mitra. Hello. Oh. Um... Tyler, it's a great uh, talk. I think a lot of information we got it from this, you know, highly spatial data. So I'm just curious, like, you know, from the immunosuppressive point of view, like the conventional cytokines, like say Alta and TGA beta, those kind of cytokines you didn't detect it that high from the suppressive standpoint. I mean, based on your data set, I mean, can you explain a little bit on it? Yeah, I, I think that this is, in my view of this, and actually when I was at SITSI at the, at the myeloid um, uh, program at, at SITSI, there was a really good talk that talked about this. Um, I think this inflammatory program is like this default program and it is pulling all of these cells into the environment. Um, and there was you know, some provocative data there with lineage tracing in mice where this program is being expressed. All these cells are coming in. You get like thousands of, of myeloid cells expressing this program that infiltrate in. And then some of them survive and then they, they go down and transform more to become these immunosuppressive programs. But it's like maybe one out of a thousand or something that actually survive and, and have a long-term um, immunosuppressive or, or other activities in the tumor. So I think that it's a it's sort of a two-stage thing. You get one, all these cytokines, you get more recruitment, and then the actual immunosuppression probably comes from cells that are derived from those cells that come in, I think. That's my and uh, one more question I have is, is it a specifically glioma specific event? Because there are also like say bank or breast cancer kind of, which are also myeloid rich and even the lung cancer too. I mean, did you think like it can, you can see similar phenotype or it's just a unique signature? So I imagine that if we do this on other cancer types, we're going to get a lot of overlapping um, programs. And, and so I imagine what will happen is we will have this IL-1 beta program is going to be in every cancer. Yeah. Um, and the the maybe the C1Q program is like in every cancer that in patients that are treated with dexamethasone. The scavenger immunosuppressive program that was really associated with hypoxia, I don't know. I mean, hypoxia is a feature of gliomas um, that that is like sort of telltale for glioblastoma. So it's present there, but in tumors that don't have hypoxia, will it be the same? I don't know. I actually also don't know what if it's driven. It's, it doesn't seem like it's driven by hypoxia itself. It may be that the dead cells in the hypoxic core are causing this to be upregulated. And if so, if there are dead cells in other cancer types, maybe this program gets upregulated. Super interested in, you know, if people that are, that are interested in collaborating on this and looking at, you know, if you're an expert in your own tissue type, I'm thinking about this and and putting those all together and then looking at what's unique to one type versus not. Sure, thank you. <clears throat> you know, I would like to say that we've been doing single cell analysis of lung tumors, mouse models of lung tumors, and find that in a somewhat uh, convergent um, result that cells that appear to have a, a, a blood derived or bone marrow derived origin versus cells that have a resident origin actually converge can converge on on the same hypoxic proangiogenic phenotype um so it's it's using the standard analysis that you described doesn't accurately represent this um 
And so my uh, what I wanted to ask you was whether your hypoxic phenotype exhibits um, signs of stimulating angiogenesis, also like expression of VEGF, et cetera. Yeah, we, there is another, um, there was another program that was hypoxia response. So there were some myeloids that were clearly hypoxia that had a very clear hypoxia response program that had some of those. And the malignant cells in that area have, you know, are expressing VEGF and other things that are, that are similar to this. The scavenger immunosuppressor program itself was not. Mm -hmm. um, and then in, just one more question. In a lot of uh, tumors, the analysis of the macrophage phenotypes has identified a type that is uh, pro-fibrotic, uh, particularly like in pancreatic cancer, and uh, we've also observed it in lung cancer. Is there a similar phenotype in gliomas? Um, in most gliomas, no. There's like gliosarcomas where you have some of this, but but um, most gliomas don't have fibroblasts in them, for example, or at least that we think about them as fibroblasts. Um, and so that's a whole different, you know, I imagine in, in breast and pancreas and other places where there's a lot of, um, you know, tumor-associated fibroblasts that you'll see, you might see a different interaction and maybe there's a program in those types of tumors that we don't see in glioma. Um, and so this four uh, quadrant uh, data set is, uh, have you applied it to uh, other types of tumors yet? Do you know if it holds for other types of tumors? We, we haven't yet, um, but I am very, very happy to do that. Great. Um, yeah. David Reardon? Hi, David. <laughs> hey, Judy, how are you? <laughs> Great talk, Tyler. Thank you. Um, really, really terrific work. Um, I just um, had a um wanted to ask a little bit more about the dexamethasone question. You know, we know we've published um, that independent of tumor size, degree of surgery, you know, uh, bulk, et cetera, other factors that dexamethasone use is associated is a poor outcome, uh, multivariate independent factor. But in your analysis, um, you know, the, the patients who need dexamethasone are the ones with the big bulkier tumors. So right. how did you control for for that and its you know kind of impact on on the programming? Um, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean it, it's a great, great and it's it's um, a very accurate point. I think for I will say for um, the large analysis where we had all of the the um, tumors in it, there and and you know Charles was at McGill and was a neurosurgery resident there and and, and sort of understood how people people just have different prescribing practices on the amount of dexamethasone they give. So they, they all got dexamethasone. Every patient at McGill got dexamethasone, um, but they just tend to, some people tend to give lower doses and some people give higher doses. And so some of that was controlled just by like who happened to be the surgeon. It wasn't necessarily uh, who had the bigger tumor. For the Boston cohort, what we did is we actually tried to do this by getting rid of tumors that had hypoxia as a main um, uh, one of the main signatures in there. And, and that allowed us to like say, hey, these are all um, areas of the tumor that weren't this like big bulky hypoxic core thing and, and were just like controlled for by in the same sort of area of the tumor. And, and that's how we tried to get around it, um, thinking about uh, yes versus no from dexamethasone. And then of course we had the functional experiments where you can put it out and it's like very clearly upregulating that program. We have a cohort of uh, tumors here um, where we've not given steroids, you know, not the, the usual um, pre uh, night before surgery, morning of surgery. We've had, you know, our patients were um, Nino and the, the neurosurgery team have held that for some of our immunotherapy trial patients. So we do have some um, tumors if you need them or it would be helpful for additional analysis where we did not have um, steroids on board perioperatively. That's great. Appreciate that. Thank you. We have a question in the chat that's uh, similar to a burning question I had. Uh, so Anna Mafra writes, a uh, very interesting talk. Thank you. How do you intend to modulate or target the immunomodulatory programs, either experimentally or, or clinically? And then um, how is immune checkpoint blockade um, Combining yeah. such with the checkpoint blockade, how do you think it will affect um, the outcome? Yeah. This this is a this is sort of the, the the specific aims of my grants basically, um, 
and and the idea is can we use this um can we use this organoid system in in sort of a sort of a scalable way to test different perturbations that we think from the data we think might be changing these programs and the goal here would be push them away from the immunosuppressive programs and, and maybe towards that CXCR4 inflammatory program. And the the first thing will be, can we just do that? Can we get the programs to change? Which I, I think we can. We have some data to show that we can. Um, and then if we combine it with immunotherapy, if we kind of checkpoint, we've combined, we've we've done some some experiments with CAR T cells, for example, as well. Can that make those therapies more effective? I think I, I still need to work out the experimental model conditions where we can have T cells that are targeting some antigen that's in the organoid where we can suppress or, or maintain um, uh, the effectiveness of those T cells so that we have a readout that we can answer this question. Like that, that model isn't completely worked out yet, but part of the thing that I want to do first when I start my own lab. Um, so I have a technical question. How long do the T cells last in the organoids? Um, the T cells, the endogenous T cells from the tumor last like a couple of weeks mm -hmm. at most. Um, so they're, have, they're good to go. Have you tried adding any therapeutics and observe what happens within that two week period? Do you, can you observe any changes? Um, we haven't just because our focus hasn't been on the T cells at the moment. Um, it is something that I want to try to do. The other thing that we have tried to do is add back T cells and they get into the organoids really well. Um, like it, like better than the myeloid cells, they sort of just like burrow in and, and they get spread throughout. So I think if we can come up with a targeting T cell that has antigen on the, the organoid, cause the endogenous ones typically aren't being simulated by an antigen. Um, and and then figure out what the conditions are, then we can actually make this work. The problem, we tried CAR T cells initially, we had EGFR CAR T cells and they just like killed out the whole organoid. Even if we put like a thousand CAR T cells in there and they're like, there's like 200,000 um, uh, malignant cells in this organoid, they just like proliferate like crazy. And, and within a week or 10 days, like they basically kill all the cells. So we have to modulate that system a little bit more. That was promising though. Um, so I, I just have a question really about glioblastoma. It sounds as if some kind of more targeted therapeutic that can inhibit edema would be um, better for patients, um, something that doesn't uh, have the, uh, the bad effects on the myeloid compartment. Is that, is that correct? I, I think that would be great. Um, but I think you know, it's a challenge, right? Because some of these patients, they come in, they're symptomatic, and you got to give them something. And um, bevacizumab doesn't work very acutely. Um, that's been one option. And you have some very acute things that you can do, like mannitol and other things to decrease pressure. But um, but it's some, you have to do something about the swelling and the edema. And we do, I don't know what it is. David probably has a better answer than I do for, <laughs> for what we might be able to do. But this is this is something I've been thinking about for a while. Yeah, no, we, we've, we, I wish I did. We've been substituting um, bevacizumab for our symptomatic cerebral edema patients uh, for our immunotherapy trials to avoid steroids um, if there is no contraindication clinically. But yeah, um, we, we, do, we do need to better understand the biology of this and um, target therapies that may be able to decrease the swelling and edema without an anti-inflammatory effect potentially. Mm -hmm. I uh, I have a potential. Maybe we can discuss together offline um, something that works for uh, regulating both aspects. Um, not currently uh, in the clinic, though, or at least not anymore. <laughs> so that might might be interesting. Great. Uh, well, we have a lot of nice comments congratulating you on a fantastic talk in the chat. Um, are there any more questions? Joanna, I would think you might have something to say. <laughs> uh, I can, uh, yeah, I can, I can add some, um, some other questions. I guess, Tyler, I have a question about the, the, the immunomodulatory uh, program you found in association with the hypoxic niche did you find that any of those genes are potentially direct targets of HIV transcriptional factors? 
Yeah, um, not really. Um, and I, so, so what I actually thought I was like, oh, this is going to be great. It's going to be like VEGF or something or HIF that are like driving these programs. And so we put those cells into hypoxia. We did all kinds, of, we tried different conditions. Nothing actually stimulated that program. And then I was talking to smarter immunologists than, than I, and they were like, oh, it's probably just dead cells. Like if you yeah. think about hypoxic regions, you get necrotic areas, and then you get hypoxic around it. So you have a bunch of dead cells in there. And so it's probably just the dead cells that are stimulating the upregulation of the scavenger receptors. And so we tried some pilot experiments where we would kill cells by treating with temozolomide or, or some other way of like killing cancer cells um, and then put myeloid cells on. And then you see some of this upregulation, but that, that system is not perfect because it's like trying to get the right amount of cell killing without, it, it was, it was clear that that was more promising for stimulating this than hypoxia itself. So, but maybe your organized system could be very useful for that because of course the challenge with organized is that you get these hypoxic cores at the center of the organized. So maybe in that context, you may be able to recapitulate the program. Yeah. I think if you grow them big enough, right, yeah. you get the hypoxic core where you get some death, then I think that's great. And that, that's like on the list of things to do. We actually tried to just like see from the ones we had if we saw difference, but we, we needed to basically grow them bigger than what we were letting them grow. And we just haven't done that experiment yet, but I think it's a good idea. And maybe the last question I quickly ask you then, did you look at neutrophils at all in, in this context? Or were they, because of course we know from, from the work of, of, of others and the, the work that we've recently done that of course these are very fragile cells and you need to have perhaps different methods to be able to recover those. So I'm just wondering where they featured in your myeloid cell space. I think it's fantastic. And your guys' paper is fantastic. I I, I I don't know anything about neutrophils <laughs> in, in many ways. And so we sort of like ignore, in many ways, we just ignored them. They were like in, they were like in the, the, the analysis. We, we saw them in our tumors. Interestingly, 10X data, we, the 10X data that was published uh, that we utilized did not have uh, like almost any neutrophils in it. We used a different method called Sequel, which basically just, mm -hmm. just basically layer on the cells on this, this, what looks like a microscope slide with nano wells in it. And so it's much gentler in, in terms of like handling the, the cells. And so we got a lot of neutrophils in our samples. Um, so they're there. There's a lot of analysis being done. There's probably, we saw different subtypes of neutrophils. We just sort of clustered them all together and, and put them into the data so that people that know more about them than I do can can do something with them, hopefully. <laughs> but, but I think if we had a good um, collaborated in a neutrophil system where we could take neutrophils and put them onto the organoids. I think that's also super interesting. We could try to study yeah. them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, that area just got me scared because it's like complicated to do anything with neutrophils, it feels like. It is. They, they make uh, macrophages look easy to study. So. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Hey, any more questions? Um, Really, I, I think you're, I want to say that's just amazing work. Um, congratulations again. And uh, I'm sure you'll have a lot of people reaching out to you for collaborations, discussions, because it's uh, very stimulating, exciting work. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Your, uh, position search, I kind of doubt it will be difficult. <laughs> so. I, it's, I just have to make a choice. It's a difficult one. Yeah. yeah. But that's a good position to be in. So, <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. And, uh, have a nice end of year, everyone. Happy holidays, everyone. Yeah. Happy holidays to everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.